here today with my guest, Lucy Handley, who is the uh, founder and director of Department 83. But we know each other from way back when, don't we, Lucy? We were at Fashion exactly. College. Well, I say Fashion College. It was a bit of a, a mix of subjects that we studied, wasn't it? It was, yes. Um, fashion design. We did three months, um, I think, uh, going around textiles, photography, this, that and the other before settling on fashion. So yes. We were... Yeah, so we, we were known as the fashion girlies, I remember. <laughs> Are, Jackie. We, we still, still are. are that's true that's true uh, so we we and we've stayed in contact all the way through these years but but more so even through through lockdown haven't we you know we more so and I, yeah. I have to say and the fact that we've expanded our our, our fashion girlies to include the textile girlies so yeah. well, it's great isn't it that we've, yeah. we've I think eight of us are now in regular contact which is fantastic yes yeah because you know we 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 stretch back to the 80s which is a bit scary when you think about it now, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a while. It's been a while. So in terms of, you know, this particular podcast and discussing uh, creativity, can you, uh, bearing in mind where we met and your journey, because I, I know um, that your career has, has gone from, you know, a bit like mine, you know, it's gone off in all directions. It's not been one kind of career ladder. It's been that sort of jungle gym kind of approach to where we go and what we do. So can you just tell us uh, a kind of your journey from, from fashion and, uh, and textiles all the way through to Department 83 and what you're up to now? Ah, okay. Um, well, I could be here forever, but I'll, I'll, I'll condense it. Um, but yes, I think um, while uh, I was at art college with you, I think my, my, my aim was to do something within the, uh, I suppose, the creative world and, and fashion. But I think um, deep in my heart, I was never really into fashion, <laughs> um, which is odd because when I left, I went um, I, uh, into fashion retail and uh, worked uh, in the merchandising department and also on shop floor and window display um, for ETAM, if you remember ETAM. Oh, and then moving from ETAM, I, I was actually, um, uh, I went to work for a company called Pilot Clothing who had a small number of shops and those expanded. I did that for a year before moving completely in a different direction, but still with retail. And that was into um, BT, British Telecom, and the BT shops as uh, they were in those days on quite a significant number of high streets. And um, I actually uh, ended up being with BT. I thought I was going to be there for two years and thought, I'll do that and I'll move on. I uh, ended up being there for nearly 10 years uh, and had a variety of different roles from moving on from the shops. I, I ended up working in um, BT Europe. So working with the BT um, uh, joint venture companies in many European companies countries including France, Germany, um, Sweden, uh, Spain, Italy and then from there um, I, I moved into what was called BT Mobility uh, which was really looking at how companies, um, technology and telecom companies were preparing for in those days 2G. Wow. <laughs> 2G. Now I'm about 5G and I'm now still quite heavily involved in the uh, telecom and technology world and we're all talking about 5G now and actually talking 6G and beyond as well. So um, yes, I uh, uh, moved on from BT to set up my own business, um, which is just under 20 years old now. And very much um, we focus, uh, I suppose 90% of our time really on um, returnable speaker programs for our customers. So therefore we work very closely with conference producers in order to um, uh, pitch stories and content and speakers um, that we would then place at an industry focused conference. So I suppose you could see us really as a little bit like 3D PR whereby uh, People in the media, uh, PR companies will be lobbying stories to journalists. We lobby speakers and content to conference producers, um, which include the likes of like the FT, Bloomberg, Economist, uh, Politico, for example. So, um, yes, that's what I've been doing for yeah, nigh on 20 years. But 
but I have always, always tried to be creative. In, yes. In no, but I, you know, I mean, the whole, the whole point is that I think even though you've gone uh, into the corporate world and you're working globally and you're working with telecoms and stuff, actually, I think what you do and having known you for all that, all that time, what you do is very creative anyway. I think you are very creative in your, in your work life. I mean, I, I just made a note there because I suddenly remembered uh, meeting you back. I don't know if it was the early 90s and, and you were saying, oh, they, one day everybody will have their own phone. And I can remember saying to you, no, don't be ridiculous. I, I would never have my own phone. Why, why would I want somebody to be able to contact me all the time? Because uh, at that point, people just didn't have mobile phones. And, you know, that's so, so alien now. But you were there, right? Right there at that sort of, you know, the forefront that were all that kind of technology that we now take for granted. Oh, don't we don't just, yes. Yeah. And um, I don't think I could have ever, have, ever have really uh, thought we'd have come this far. Uh, if you include social media and uh, all the ways we now communicate and uh, and the ways we take for granted, as you say. But uh, yes, it's interesting the fact that, you know, you and I, um, um, you know, in our early working life, we didn't have any of that to yeah. hand. We had no Google, we had no mobile phones, no social media. We just sort of got on with, got on with yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it doesn't feel that long ago. I remember, you know, back in the early 2000s, working at the National Theatre doing um, some costume work. And there was a, com there was a computer in the, in the sort of the, the workroom. Um, and, I, and I hardly ever used it. I mean, I wrote long lists out by hand and, you know, I phoned people with, a, with the phone that didn't go anywhere. And it was, and, and, you know, and that was not even 20 years ago. So, yeah, we do, we do take it all a long way. I have to say it's been a short time really in terms of technology advances. It's quite yeah. amazing. But I do remember as well, going back when you were working for, for BT and coming in when you were, when you were putting together uh, that adverts and promotional things. Yeah. All internal, I have to say, not, yeah. not external um, videos, but yes, you, you, you came in and helped with that. That was fantastic. And um, that went out to, that was a promotional uh, instructional uh, uh, video that we put together for the BT shops um, about how they would lay out their <laughs> shop floors and their windows. I have to say, obviously, we were limited with the product in those days. There were only so many telephones um, yeah. and there's only so much you can do with the telephone. So we had to be very creative <laughs> in what we did. <laughs> but with ETAM weren't you window dressing? So was that sort of, that was a kind of a Yes, so I, I did. I started off as a window dresser at ETAM um, in uh, in Hampshire, and then um, I moved on to become an area display um, manager. So I would go around various um, stores um, and uh, give guidance on um, on on the window dressing and the floor layout. Um, even Guernsey and Jersey, I used to fly from Heathrow to Jersey, and then I'd fly on a little yellow hopper. Um, plane between the islands and they used to seat you by weight and they'd always seat me by the pilot who looked like Captain Birdseye. <laughs> oh. I'd be sitting there with my little bag going, oh. yeah. yes so another world really but yeah, um, it was very interesting and the one thing I would say that that gave me was um, a fantastic sense of geography of the UK because I think I visited by car with a map no, no, um, you know, satellite navigation, nothing of that, just a map and me, no mobile phone in those days. And um, I think I went to practically every major city and smaller versions as well yeah. in the UK. And I think that, that, that really stood me in good stead to sort of know exactly where any city, town or anywhere is on the map of England now. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, just in terms of obviously that, that kind of career trajectory, that's the correct way of saying it, um, it, 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 it's, it is very, it, I just wonder whether creative thinking rather than, you know, the, the difference between, what do you think is the difference between uh, sort of being creative and being an artist? So I think sometimes people get, get um, mixed up or if you say to somebody, do you think you're creative? They will say no, because they can't draw, they can't paint. Yeah. And so they automatically assume they are not creative. Yes. Whereas I think, you know, there's a, they, they get mixed up between a, a creative and an artist. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yes, it does. It, it's, it's difficult when people do that because everybody's creative. Absolutely everybody. You're creative when you get up in the morning and make a cup of tea. Um, you've chosen a mug, a cup, 
you've got to purchase that usually. Um, and just doing that has been creative. So um, the way you brush your teeth, the way you brush your hair, everybody, everybody on this planet is creative. And yes, it's how you use that creativity, whether it's uh, in thought or in deed. But yes, I think it's, 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 it's difficult sometimes for people to separate being artistic to being creative. Yeah. But uh, yes, we but all have do you think born creative then? Yes, I think everyone is born creative because every human being is creative. You know, we, we are born with um, that creative streak to, to create and whether that be to create uh, um, work for ourselves, food for ourselves, um, rather than just going and killing something and eating it raw. Um, you know, we, we are creative. We have that different brain that um, uh, ensures that we, we, we think creatively and it, as I say, it could be something incredibly minor that you're not even really processing. Um, but uh, every thought I think that we have is creative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know certainly from, you know, you talk about um, cooking and <laughs> rather than eating things raw. And I know your husband is a, is a, a fantastic cook. I've, I've sampled lots and lots of his food, but you are too. And actually, you know, when you, when you uh, set up a pop-up restaurant. Oh, gosh, yeah. So again, what a creative thing to do, you know, with with uh, with John doing the cooking, but you know, you front of house and that that whole kind of performance of of creating a space that you know it, it was I don't know how how would you describe it? Was it sort of a, a escapism for people to come to this sort of pop up? I think, I, think, I think it was. I mean, it was literally born out of, we had our 25th wedding anniversary and we bought, uh, we had, which you came along to, yeah. and we did a sit down uh, lunch, as you know, for um, 60 friends and family. And we bought all this crockery and cutlery and at about two o'clock in the morning, we were standing around the uh, fire pit. Somebody said, so what are you going to do with it all? We went, oh, I don't know. And somebody said, why don't you do a pop-up restaurant? So we went, oh, okay then. And it was born from that. Um, Plus the fact the, the village didn't have or still doesn't have um, a pub that serves food. Yeah. And the only pub that was serving food was moving away from, from, from that. So we were fulfilling a need. And um, it's, it's great, isn't it? That people didn't have to drive to Marlborough or Pusey. They could actually come to the village and um, see people who in the village that quite often tables would get up and go oh I didn't realize you were going to be here and uh, so that was that was lovely it was challenging we had to be very creative in the kitchen uh, the majority of the time we popped up in the Burbage church hall and while the hall is uh, great it's easy easy to dress it's got a nice wooden floor uh, its structure is uh, creative uh, but the kitchen is a tiny galley kitchen <laughs> so we'd be having to do a lot of this behind each other's backs and we had to have a lot of patience with each other so there were two chefs John and uh, Tim in the kitchen and then we'd have um, usually four of us uh, in front of house so um, who are all coming in and out of the kitchen as well so yes but we did it and it was six, we did it for five years yeah. um, I look back we, we, we were intending to do one the one off <laughs> just as a bit of fun and then uh, it was the demand for that so uh, and as I say, ideas and being creative can come out of so many different um, thoughts and uh, ideas. And I think the other th important thing is being creative is, is sometimes a group thing rather than an individual thing. Yeah. And actually spending time with people and discussing ideas. And I think there's nothing better than a, a, a problem shared uh, in a group um, that can be uh, really expand on creativity and come up with a solution. Yeah. Um, so yeah no absolutely i i mean my my whole thing with um Atticus arts is is about collaboration and you know like you like you were saying i think a lot of creativity is problem solving you know there, there's an issue and it needs to be solved how do you do that you have to do it with with creative thinking and actually brainstorming with other people and, and being in a room with other people and those ideas just they, they spark that sometimes you know you need other people to to be able to do that it's, yeah and and obviously within your business now within department 83 you've got a, a team around you haven't you so do, is that how it works for you because I, I noticed from from the website that it's not just the speakers that that you that you place it's also about marketing and promotion and, and business strategies and, and that kind of thing so how do you work as a team so as a team um, and this is quite interesting because um, since inception we have usually worked remotely from home uh, 
and the office, but I initially had a team that was quite widely dispersed. I had a couple of freelancers based in France, one in Paris, one in the south of France, and um, I had freelancers based up and down the country as well. So um, very early on, in I think it was about 2004-05, we um, uh, took on the cloud. So we have a hosted desktop. We've had that since 2004. Um, And uh, we um, got used to working remotely or wherever, um, as long as we could log on to our our remote system. So when lockdown happened, that um, it didn't really affect us from that perspective. And I know a lot of people who work in offices and go to an office day to day and suddenly having to work from home found that very, that, that change quite difficult to um, to really take on board for quite some time so from a from a work perspective um, that's been quite the norm for us but with the team um, all my team are freelancers apart from myself um, and John who's also works with department 83 um, and uh, nobody's full-time and I never ever took on anybody full-time right from um, the start of Department 83 for the very reason that um, I wanted to have creative people on board, people who had their own businesses. So two of my freelancers have their own businesses as well as work for Department 83. Um, And uh, other freelancers have a lot of other interests in other areas as well. And I think that has allowed us to be permanently recreating and um, problem solving uh, much faster than I think we would have been if we were all full-time employees purely focusing on, on, uh, on the work that Department 83 uh, um, deploys. So I think our working philosophy right from the start has very much been one of um, uh, bringing ideas to the table um, allowing people the flexibility of working wherever they want to be, um, other side of the world, it doesn't matter, and giving, uh, having the trust in people as well, rather than clock watching, and um, giving people respect, and uh, that has always come back to Department 83, and we're a, we're a close-knit team, we all know each other, it's family, um, since uh, I, I Three of my freelancers, I've known all their children since birth. So it's quite interesting. So they're now in their 20s. It's yes. quite scary. Yes. So yes, it's, um, I think that's helped. That really has helped us develop and progress yeah. and grow yeah. um, and helped us be more creative. Yeah. And I, I know during, um, obviously with the, the pandemic, that uh, a lot of the huge conferences that, that were a big part of what you do were no longer happening. So how did you cope with that? Oh, that, that was quite a shock initially I think the very first big conference um, that was talked about was before we went into lockdown it would have gone ahead in February in Barcelona which is the Mobile World Congress it's a huge huge conference and exhibition Um, over 100,000 people uh, attend that from worldwide and um, when that was cancelled I think we all thought okay this is the beginning of um, a significant um, downturn in the face-to-face physical uh, conference um, industry so um, we did a lot of thinking and we have over the last few years um, actually placed our speakers from our, our, our client base at a number of webinars and so we started to look at this and um, we are now only placing speakers from our client um, our, so our customers were placing them at virtual events only and um, we've placed them at uh, FT virtual events Bloomberg virtual events um, we've got an event happening this week um, and the most interesting thing is people don't have to get on a plane and travel yeah. so we've got an event taking place in New York and the speaker is actually going to be sitting in Finland and the same speaker is going to be doing another event literally directly after um, the event that would have been in New York in Singapore. So <laughs> it's almost like time travel. Yeah. Um, and it's allowing, I think, a lot more business to be undertaken. So if you think about the time wasted through travel, um, and particularly in the uh, event world, 
Um, people are moving um, significantly around from uh, event to event worldwide. And the cost involved in putting speakers and people manning exhibition stands, etc., cetera, um, up in hotels, it's, the cost is um, quite significant. So a lot of that, has, people have started to think completely differently. Uh, and, and it doesn't replace that physical one-to-one -one, um, meeting that you would get. But we are starting to take that on board. And I think there's a lot of companies who are being incredibly creative in making the whole virtual experience much more um, pleasurable in terms of, um, I think from a sales perspective as well. So um, there's been some, and I think lockdown and COVID, while it's been terrible, um, has actually brought some amazing um, changes in the way we work and how creative we can be using those technologies. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, from, from the, the, the learning that I've been doing in, uh, in lockdown, which, you know, it's just given me that time to actually look at different things and different ways of doing things. I've realised because I've been working with my adult drama class around uh, past pandemics you know, like the plague and, you know, the, the Spanish flu. And actually out of all those, there's so much innovation comes out of just having that time to go, okay, we need to regroup and rethink about what it is that, that we can do with this. So do you, think that, do you think there'll be much innovation that will come out of this in terms of your business? Um, well, I think we are, um, we, we already... It, it already has, I think, from um, we're now working, we've actually, I think as well, this is interesting. So a number of um, event organisers initially, I don't think could really get their heads around moving from the whole physical to virtual, especially if they hadn't actually um, run a series of webinars previously. Yeah. So um, we have given them ideas in terms of how they can use this suggest platforms there's a platform called on 24 which is really good um so i think the whole industry has worked um creatively together to um benefit that industry because it's an industry that many millions of people work in and um and it has suffered majorly so i think um helping each other um, in that area can only benefit going forward because we don't know really when large scale events will or if they ever will um, take off again in the same way as they, they have done in the past. I mean, I, I, I still find it difficult to uh, get my head around the fact that we used to have over 120,000 people attend an, an event for four days crammed into pretty small spaces really. Um, whether people will feel confident to do that, particularly over the next two or three years where we may see, you know, further waves, if it follows Spanish flu, for example, um, it would be, a, that's the way viruses go, isn't it? They, they will do this. So I don't know whether many people would want to. So how we all move forward um, to progress um, in terms of um, industry, then I think more and more people are going to be looking into different ways of how we communicate. Like this, I mean, you know, you yeah. and I having this conversation, it feels incredibly natural. Whereas maybe a year ago, it would have felt difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, and also we've got things like five G coming on board. We've got faster broadband on a daily basis coming down. More fibre to the home than ever before, um, rather than fibre to the box, which means then you get a trickle to your home, which you know can create stilted broadband so the the actual technologies um that are allowing us to do this and feel as though we're in the same room together which is just lovely um can be developed and developed further so i think that's that's that can only be a good thing for all of us and and for department 83 yeah yeah Definitely. I mean, in terms of the lockdown and, and sort of creativity for yourself, I mean, and I know, I know that, you know, without even, even lockdown, you're, you're very creative in your spare time. And, and I, would I be right in saying that you kind of use that as a, as a well-being tool? Uh, so so ex, explain to us a little bit about what it is that you do that kind of fulfills that, that space for you. Well, I think that um, there's a few things, but I think the most important one for me has been um, singing. And um, I belong, as you know, to a small eight piece, all female a cappella group. Um, we sing um, uh, soprano two parts and alto two parts. And I sing um, top soprano with my soprano twinny, Shelley. 
And um, that, I think, from a well-being and a mental health um, and a support group uh, has really been the, one of the most amazing experiences I've had um, since we kicked it off in 20, 2014 now. Um, so not being able to meet in lockdown was very hard. Not being able to sing. And um, we did actually try singing uh, on Zoom um in early days and we did a couple of digital virtual recordings whereby everybody sings individually and then somebody stitches it all together and puts it out you everyone's seen these all over the place and um that was fun to do but it's 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 you're doing it in isolation and that's not fun and so you're only hearing your own voice and when you hear your own voice playing back singing a song it sometimes just sounds pretty awful and <laughs> you put the other voices together and it can sound amazing and you think wow and it's the same you know you sing together in a quiet it's it's a wonderful wonderful feeling and um we have missed that but last week drum roll we had our first physical meeting um we have scoured all the government guidelines and we know we're following guidelines um the correct guidelines so we're not breaking any rules and six of us met um socially distanced and we don't sing in the direction of each other um, but it was so wonderful again to actually rather than being on a zoom choir rehearsal where you're singing <laughs> by being muted so you're just singing to yourself to sit down with our music, our, our music scores and write on them and talk about, oh, actually, does that work? No, maybe we could change that note, blah, blah, blah. And it was refreshing. And, and I think whether it be a, a choir or any group that meets and that hasn't been able to meet, I think it, it has been soul destroying for so yeah. many, so many people. And I, I really worry about the mental health of um, people going forward um so the sooner we can move to getting back to doing things that we have done in the past um because human beings are sociable beings we yeah, need to be yeah. together we need to be able to touch each other and pat each other on the back and um give each other smiles um which you can do on zoom of course but it's not quite the same so um singing for me is a release and um it's also incredibly good exercise because you're um you're you're filling your lungs so you're exercising you're um bringing oxygen to the brain you're physically exercising when you're standing up as well and um from from a being together as a group it's just a lovely um it just lifts the soul yeah. i think it's a wonderful well, thing. I, I do I, I i absolutely agree with that I'm, and i know um getting back into a room with my drama group as well you know it's it's just there's nothing quite like it there isn't nothing, anything quite like it i mean it just it made me think while you were talking there about um you know if this had ha if this had have happened back when we were teenagers can you imagine you know there were there were no phones i mean literally sitting in the in, in the hallway on the telephone you know having to ask permission if you could use the phone you know four channels if we were lucky back then really so what? <laughs> we had two yeah. we had a television that only got bbc <sighs> one and two <laughs> yeah it, w it would have been awful wouldn't it i mean that would that would have been uh, a really really difficult. absolutely i i think you know and that's why i still think the 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 creative bods in the technology world that have allowed us to do this through zoom webex you know skype etc all of those platforms has been wonderful and whatsapp you know you look at the whatsapp group that we use for the fashion yeah. and textile girlies um that's been a lifeline yeah. and kept us all sane with uh you know little messages that we all get all at once i think it's lovely to have those groups yeah. set up yeah. whether they're for family for for you know friends or or for working groups yeah. we're very fortunate i think in some respects <laughs> to live in this age that we do now yeah. um and uh and and i think maybe i'm going off at a bit of a tangent here but the lockdown early lockdown i think was very good though for being creative you were you you you, you mentioned earlier about the things that um um maybe i've done in during lockdown to keep uh, keep me sane um and i think having that time where it was so quiet and there was no traffic um i actually did some exercises in the middle of the a346 which yeah. is <laughs> road all the way from um uh, Salisbury to Mulber uh, and upwards further and I literally <laughs> did sit-ups um, with my legs either side of the double white lines wow. and the, the dog lying in the road next to me 
<laughs> well, I hope you took some photos. I'd like to see that. I, did. I didn't. I didn't have my phone with me that day. It's probably just as well. Yeah. But, um, so, so there's there's been. We've had the time. I think we've all been able to just go <sighs> to breathe. Yeah, breathe and think. Uh, and think differently, um, and whether it's been bread making, cake making, or gardening, or moving furniture around. We actually had a bit of a change of furniture in the household because we had time to be here and actually look and think, well, actually, maybe I'd like that sofa in a slightly different way. And so just having that pause. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I know some people have had more pause than others in terms of being furloughed and unable to work um um but other people have had to do things differently with work so um i think we've all had that time to be a lot more creative yes and a, and a fun thing for you that i know you've been doing in lockdown is looking after hedgehogs um, how, did, how did that come about well not just in lockdown actually we've we've always looked after hedgehogs um we um we had hedgehogs i think it was about the first hedgehog we had about 10 years ago and we had a little this time of the year is we take a step back a, a difficult time for um hedgehogs late summer particularly if we have a very very dry uh, late summer there's no water around and juvenile hedgehogs can come out during the day and if you see a juvenile hedgehog out in the day it's not good news there's something wrong it's usually the fact that they are dehydrated um so what you should do is only give them water never food and um as soon as possible try and get them to a hedgehog rescue center so 10 years ago, we had one hedgehog, uh, that had a juvenile that appeared in our garden. We took it down to um, a rescue place and said, look, we want him back. <laughs> we want a hedgehog in our garden. We'll give you, we'll throw money at you because that's all we can do. Um, and we'll provide food and this, that and the other. And um, if you could look after him for a few weeks, um, if he survives, and then we'll take him back to hibernate. And they said, okay. Brilliant. So um, when uh, we went to pick him up, they said, could you take a couple more too? <laughs> said, okay. So they said, you've got to keep them indoors for the next eight weeks. Um, so we had them in a pen, in an old dog pen, and um, we had to weigh them once a week. And eventually we got these hedgehogs. By the way, they are pigs. They, 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 they make an awful lot of mess. And um, uh, it looked every morning when we came down, it looked as though they'd had a, a massive party the night before. <laughs> they probably had. <laughs> um, and of course they're nocturnal, so they would want to walk around and do things. And of course we were, we, we were stopping that because we were trying to get them up to a decent weight for them to hibernate. And then we actually invested in a hedgehog house along with the help of John's aunt. Um, and uh, we created a pen in the garden. Uh, we kept putting straw and leaves in there and they kept taking it into this hedgehog house um, all three of them. It was a three room hedgehog house and they all went in. Eventually the last one went in and they didn't come out and we had a very cold winter that year. It was the coldest. It went down to minus 12 here. Ooh. And um, I was so worried that they might have all frozen to death. And uh, then one April evening, um, uh, I was actually, I, I was actually at choir. Uh, and, um, I got a, I got a, um, a message, a picture message on my phone from John and it was one of the hedgehogs had just emerged very skinny from hibernation. And then two days later, the other two came out. So they all survived. We then fed them up for the next four weeks in the pen and then we released them. And interestingly, we saw, um, two of them three years later because, um, they had quite distinctive, um, spines, uh, and um, so we've, we've, we've done that over the last few years. What we've tended to do now is take them down to the Hedgehog Centre and um, say we're, we're here to, to help, put into, help put into hibernation and release, etc. when necessary. But quite often now we're just taking them, people bring them to us and then we take them down to the Hedgehog Centre. Yeah, yeah. So yes, that's a, I love hedgehogs. Yes. Uh, not. And that's, you know, that is something I didn't actually know about you, Lucy, after all these years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got to touch on the fact that you are now a farmer's wife. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Trout. <laughs> yes, a fish farmer's Trout. wife. A yes. fish farmer's wife. Yes, yes, we have actually, since the 1st of September, taken over a business, taken over um, Berkshire Trout Farm, which is just the other side of Hungerford. And uh, it's a big change for us. John, as you know, um, he used to be a trout farmer um, and he's always worked in the trout um, industry 
uh, aquaculture industry and um, it's a oh, it, the, the farms are about 120 years old maybe about 115 and it is a restocking farm at the moment um, and will continue to be so for brown trout which is the native species to the UK and the rainbow trout which um, isn't um, native to the UK but was brought in from the USA about um, I think about 80 years ago and um, they're quite different characters of the two fish so the brown trout is brown um, beautiful markings but quite a timid creature whereas its cousin the rainbow trout is um, the one that you would you would you would know um, if you were to purchase one in a supermarket it's got the more bright markings of pinks and purples and, and the greys and they're quite a feisty fish and uh, um, just a different character altogether. So um, the brown trout are used for, re well both fish are re used to restock fisheries and um, rivers up and down the UK and um, interestingly since lockdown there have been a hundred thousand new fisher men and women who've taken up the sport Wow. Very quickly in terms of creativity with that. I mean, obviously John's doing the, the farming side of it, but obviously you're putting together again, all that sort of the creative side of the website and, you know, doing all that. Yes. So just doing the website at the moment. And I was on a uh, site on the farm on Monday, taking um, some photography, um, some decent shots because the weather was glorious and we had that misty start and it was just beautiful as the mist was clearing. Um, so we're putting the website, the new website um, together at the moment and I'm hoping that that will be up and running. Um, hopefully a holding page by holding few pages by the middle of next week and then we're moving to an e-commerce site. So the other part of the side of the business which I haven't spoken about is the fact that we are going to be um, starting to sell trout as a food product um, uh, that people will be able to purchase online. And um, we're not talking about um, trout that maybe people have remembered in the past being, you know, about this size that you have a whole one on, on your dish and you have to fiddle around with all the bones and it's all a bit difficult. Um, so the trout that um, we're going to be growing for the food industry will be about, oh, you can't even see my hands. So they're <laughs> off at this way. <laughs> I caught it, it was this big. And um, if you think about all the products that you would buy or think about with salmon, so if you buy salmon fillets, you'd be able to buy exactly the same with trout fillets. Yeah. If you buy smoke, cold smoked salmon, you can buy cold smoked trout. It's actually nicer. It's not quite as oily. And um, it doesn't make um, such a... Sometimes when you're cooking salmon, it can be quite an oily smell. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really lovely, lovely tasting fish. So yes... We're hoping to do that and we're hoping to do some trials before Christmas and then um, see how that goes. So lots happening yeah. in our household at the moment. Very busy, very busy. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, maybe being in on a taster session. Absolutely. No, definitely. You've got to come up here and we'll have a taster session, blind oh, tasting yeah. session. We'll, we'll, we'll compare salmon and trout. Yeah, I know I'd like that. I would like that. I'd love that. Brilliant. Fabulous. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time this morning, Lucy. I can't believe we've gone from global telecommunications to fish farming to hedgehog pens. I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> and everywhere in between. Oh, well, Jackie, it's been a delight to talk to you as always. Well, and, thank you very um, much. Uh, have a good rest of the day and I do hope to see you very soon. Yes. And you. Thank you very much, Lucy Handley of Department 83.